Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. It's General Conference weekend. Time to dig up the bingo cards and park yourself in front of the TV for a couple of days with some cinnamon rolls and a Diet Coke or two to soak in some inspiration and maybe encounter some discomfort. We thought we'd re-release a re-edited episode with Patrick Mason that we feel like is really timely. In this conversation with Patrick, we talk about creating what Brian McLaren has called a four-stage community. The stages that we're referencing here come from Brian's book, Faith After Doubt, and refer to different stages in which people might find themselves in their journeys of faith. McLaren defines these stages as simplicity, where faith is very straightforward, complexity, where faith becomes somewhat more complicated, perplexity, the stage where questions become more important than answers, and previous faith paradigms often undergo massive shifts, and then finally harmony, where the gifts of each stage are realized and integrated. It seems to us that these diverse reactions and feelings that often are engendered by General Conference are often the result of being members of a community in which all four of these stages are manifest. Messages that often seem to be tailored to members at a particular stage of faith may not resonate with listeners at a different stage, and so this can feel like misalignment and it can sometimes even feel jarring. So in this conversation, Patrick points to a couple of practices that have helped us to turn that dissonance that we sometimes feel into a gift. For one, being intentional about deeply listening to those that we might be inclined to disagree with, and orienting ourselves toward generosity, asking what virtues and values might they be speaking from. Because as Patrick points out, there's a real potential for growth when we choose to stay in relationships with people we disagree with. As Eugene England points out in his essay, the church is as true as the gospel. In many ways, the struggle is the point. Patrick is the Leonard Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture at Utah State University and the author of several books, including Restoration, God's Call to the 21st Century World. He brought wisdom, insight, and optimism that he always seems to meld so beautifully. And so we really hope that you can take what feels valuable to you in this episode and use it as we come together in solidarity as a community this weekend with all our varied life experiences and perspectives to be inspired by and stretched by General Conference. Patrick Mason. We're so happy to have you back again. Thanks so much for for coming back on for another conversation. Thanks, Aubrey. Always good to be here. Always. Hey, um, so we we wanted we wanted to have a conversation about something that I've heard a lot of feedback about. What what do you say when somebody finishes a a book, when somebody finishes restoration and and the feeling is like, yeah, I, I would like to be a part of that church, but that is not my reality. Yeah. No, I I, I hear that a lot, but I think, you know, I'm uh, I'm, I'm okay with the fact that, uh, the reality doesn't always meet our ideals, right? That, uh, I, I think it's, uh, and no doubt the, the, the kind of vision that, that I laid out in restoration, all of that is aspirational. It's, mm-hmm. it's grounded in reality. It's grounded in real things, right? We, we, we can, we can point to things where there are seeds, where, where, where there's, uh, uh, some possibility there and maybe it's not fully realized but uh but but it's still there and uh the, but but you're right the, the the challenge is then then how do you to to slip back and in, into just kind of the everyday world that um if, if, if i want to get like a little bit theological for a moment this, this is the way that um that a lot of theologians talk about the kingdom of god in the new testament so sometimes jesus says like hey the kingdom of god is right here it's with you you're the kingdom of god like Huzzah! Right, uh, and then other times it's like no, it's it's like on some way distant horizon, and so there's this sense of like it's both already here and it's not yet arrived, and that's the tension that we have to live in as as Christians. Uh, but it's, it's the tension we just we we live in, uh, you know, as, as, as Latter Day Saints too. I mean, the, the we can we both realize there's like something special going on. There, there, there is, there's something incredible about our community. There's, there's something really great. Um, but it's also not what it's meant to be yet. Uh, and I think when we lean too much into the, we've arrived, then that leads to a kind of passivity, all is well in Zion, like we don't have to do anything. Uh, that's a danger. But we, when we lean too much in the, like, this isn't yet what it's supposed to be, uh, this isn't yet what I aspire for it to be, then, you know, then, then that becomes dangerous too. So, so the, uh, be, because we're never satisfied, it's never good right. enough. It's, it's never, we're always going to be disappointed. So I think a lot of it is we just have to kind of create our own little sub communities, whether that be faith matters, right? I, I think faith matters has done a great job of creating community, uh, within the broader church or what maybe it's at the dinner table with just a handful of friends, uh, in, in your community, 
Um, but so, so in some ways, you've got to create the church that you want to be a part of uh, while also participating in, in a larger church, church as well. Yeah. Go ahead, Aubrey. Sorry. Well, let, can, before we move on from that, I, I think, you know, couldn't there be some danger too in creating a community, in creating your own little echo chamber that actually yeah. sort of divides you from the broader community? You know, like I, I appreciate yep. some breathing room, like you need, like these, these spaces of grace that Brian McClare mentioned recently. And like, that's been so beneficial for me, like just somewhere where it feels like I can, I can like relax a little bit and, and trust that people are, I mean, that I can trust the people I'm speaking with and that we can hold a little bit of space for each other, but, it, but in, in an effort to bring that back to our broader community, right? Like I, I, I yeah. as soon as yeah. it like be, sets you apart, then we have a problem again. That, that, that's exactly right. And it's that, you know, not every space can perform all those functions uh, all at once. I mean, uh, you know, yesterday I had lunch with a guy I'd never met before, but but we met and we just like hit it off immediately. Like, and we were just simpatico and we were able to talk about things, you know, including church related things in ways that I wouldn't talk about in elders quorum, right? In, in, in front of a, of a big group. And I don't think that's that's hypocrisy. That's not being two faced. It's, it's just what you're talking about, about, you know, being in spaces uh, where you're comfortable having having conversations that maybe necessarily aren't, aren't always appropriate for a, for a larger and more diverse group. I, I always remember uh, when, when I was teaching at Claremont, I had uh, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich uh, come to my class once and, you know, this like a feminist <laughs> icon. And this was this was not just a Mormon history students. I mean, it was it was all kinds of students. And so they all know her, you know, as, as just this incredible feminist scholar. And uh, but they also know that she was a Mormon and she talked about this a little bit, too. And and one of the non LDS students asked, uh, I, I think, very bravely. But they said, you know, here you are, like you're this icon of feminism. Uh, like, how in the world do you stay in this church? Right. That, that you're that you're a part of. Um, and and she, she just looked at them immediately, immediately. And she said, it's my church, too. Right. It's it's not just their church. You know, the other people don't own the church. It's 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 my church, too. And so so I want to create the church and, and be a part of the church that that I'm going to help create. Now, the, I love that sentiment. I think that's really important for everybody to kind of own their own membership and their own space within the church. But the flip side of that, the other side of the coin is it's not just your church. It's their church, too. Um, so I don't want it to be the Church of Patrick Mason. Uh, it's it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, so it's Jesus Christ Church first and foremost, but then also all of the Latter Day Saints. I'm just one of them, so uh, so there's always again it's it's about tension, it's about paradox, uh, uh, both creating space for yourself, uh, but also creating space for other people uh, and recognize that, that that other people inhabit that space as well. Yeah, one of the one of the things we've talked a lot about on this on this podcast is sort of like stages of of faith development. One of our, and one of our very favorite frameworks um, comes from Brian McLaren. He has a four stage framework that he calls simplicity, then complexity, then perplexity, then harmony or, or solidarity. And uh, that's been a really useful framework for us, but it can be tempting to try to sort of just like find your people. I mean, especially once you start thinking in these terms and separate yourself from, from the others. In, in Planted, you say, Latter-day Saints must find a way to not simply coexist, but to truly embrace diversity. When we th but, and when we think of diversity, we're off often thinking of gender or racial or sexual orientation or whatever it is. But I'm curious, if we took that sentence from Planted and applied it to the context of, like, of stages of faith, like how can, we, how can we embrace diversity when it comes to we're all in, we're all in different places in our, in our faith journey? Yeah, that's, that's such a great question. I mean, I, I immediately think of, of Paul's metaphor of the body of Christ from 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, and, and everybody knows this, but, but where, where he really talks about how the body of Christ needs all the members. It needs all the gifts. And none of the members gets to say to the other, I'm so important and, and I don't need you. Right. Or I've I've progressed, you know, I've evolved to a certain point. And so so I've, I've left you to you behind. I, I don't need you anymore. Uh, and 
the 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 stages of faith models and you know there's lots of them out there but but the, the ones that i like the best are the ones that recognize the goods that are inherent in each of the stages uh both the goods and the limitations uh and and so in a community recognizing that everybody's going to be at a different place because of their experience their perspective their worldview uh just just their own proclivities that actually the the community is better the body of christ is stronger when all the members are there i uh, i uh, with all the people in all of their different stages and 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 i think that that like it's really hard to do right es especially when you've kind of um, you've, you've, you've moved through, you've kind of passed through one stage and, and you can remember what it was like. Uh, and now you're at a different place and maybe you even are appreciative of, of, of the good things that, that, that you learned from that stage, but you're like, oh man, I'm so much happier now. I'm in a better place. It's just a very human thing to say, wouldn't it be better if everybody was like me? <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. the ego. Uh, and, uh, but, but I think what Paul is really pushing back on there is like, no, it would not be better if everybody were like you. That would be a terrible body if it were all eyes or all ears or all hearts, no matter how important each of those, those parts are. And so it's really an act of humility to, to be able to say, you know, I need not just I can coexist with, with other people in other stages, but I need them. Uh, and they act as checks on, on me and, 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 you know, when I might even have things to learn, I'm, one of the most important things for my own spirituality over the last few years has been, uh, a kind of intentional spiritual discipline of listening extra hard to the people who are different than me. And especially those that I'm inclined to disagree with. And I already know who those people are in general conference. When they stand up at the pulpit, I already know that I'm inclined to disagree with them. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or they may not be my favorite, especially, you know, when certain ward members stand up, I already know that I'm inclined to, to disagree with them uh, versus others. You know, when my friends get up, it's like, Ooh, I, I want to hear what great things they have to say that completely confirm my worldview and make me feel good about myself. Um, but you know, this is what Jesus says. If, if if you only have love for your friends, like that's that's not great, and that's not good enough. And so, so I think there's a kind of spiritual discipline of actually leaning in extra hard, and it's paid dividends for me certainly um, to say, "Wow, this person sees the world differently than me. They may be in a different stage of faith uh, than I am. So, actually, what can I learn from them?" Um, at least it's been useful for me. Yeah. And just to follow up on that, Brian, Brian talked about, um, and this is at Restore, but he, he's talked about it elsewhere, not trying to create a, what he calls a stage four community, but a four stage community in right. which, uh, in which all, uh, stages are not only welcome, but are, are welcoming of, of the other, of, of the other stages. But I want to ask sort of really in a really practical way, is that, is it possible to imagine, is it, is it possible? I've never seen it done at least the way I'm imagining it, where we're saying this is a true, this is a truly a four stage community. All are welcome. Nobody's going to feel, nobody's going to feel marginalized. Nobody's going to feel like they don't quite fit the mold. Everyone's going to be just really tolerant and really accepting of, of wherever they are. So I guess a, is that possible? And B should we, is that really what we're looking for? Or is, or, or am I missing the point if I'm looking to go to church and ever, and there's just a radical inclusivity and, and tolerance and acceptance? Because I think there's a way you could define that. Like, I, I would imagine that like Zion is a stage four community. Like it's a community where everybody's in harmony. Isn't that the goal? Yeah, well, I think there's there'd be a lot of people in, say, stage one or two say, well, it's, what Zion is actually <laughs> everybody in my stage, too. You know, uh, and I, I think the, the the hardest thing is that that especially when you're like kind of like two, you know, stages apart it's really hard to see each other when you're one stage apart, maybe, right. There, there's a kind of recognition there when, when you're two or three, again, uh, d depending on the numbers, it, it, it can be you, like the, the worldviews seem so incommensurate. Um, and, uh, and, and there's even, I, I think one of the, the downsides of, of a kind of simplicity worldview is you actually, that there can be a temptation to wish that complexity didn't exist. Um, I, to, uh, when, when you're in Eden, it, it looks pretty great and, and, and you don't want to, to leave the outside world looks pretty scary and dangerous. 
um, and, uh, and 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 vice versa, right? Once you're kind of out and you realize the the goods that come from that, you're like, oh man, I'd never want to go back there. And so so this is the challenge. I mean, I I I believe Tim. I mean, I I think a Zion community uh, has to include everybody. It has to create space for everybody. It has to create space for people with real doubts and real questions. But who who want to be there? I'll, I'll never forget what uh, a um, uh, one of my ward members back in California. Uh, I think I'd just given a plant at about Fireside and stuff, and she was great. She's just an amazing, amazing woman. We we all know lots of people like this who are just incredible uh, uh, Christians who just uh, they're very much on the simplicity side, and and she said like. I don't like, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate what you're saying. I appreciate that you're trying to create space for all these people, but like, I'm not interested, right? Like I have zero interest in going there with you. And, you know, and I realized like in that moment, in that conversation, I was kind of like, you know what? I don't have much interest in pulling you into my space either because you're doing just fine where you are. Like you are like where you are and you're understanding the gospel is motivating such acts of Christian service and love for other people yeah. better than I. And so like, who am I to like pull you into some other place uh, when, when frankly you're doing just fine. So I think our communities, we, it, it, it's so hard. It takes humility on our part and then charity and empathy to, to see um, the, the good in other people. But yeah, I, it, we, we've got to create spaces where for, for people wherever they are. Yeah. yeah. And as I've thought throughout th- through this too, I've, I've wondered if there is like a really specific purpose that each sort of, each sort of stage is contributing to the organization generally. And I've wondered if the, sort of the role, and I'm just making this up, but like the, the role of sort of a early stages, stage one and two is to create real so, sort of like boundaries that may be necessary to have, to even have what can be called a cohesive community. And if the role of uh, stage three is to sort of like push things forward to raise all of the most difficult issues yeah. and you know the role of the the later stages may be to um sort of just be at the the edge of inside sometimes pushing where necessary and you know just maybe holding the tension of not always feeling super welcome but sort of remaining regardless you know and maybe going, being the rich the builders because they've been yeah. In, yeah. in each of those spaces so they can have a, a a direct kind of sympathy for for those people and so yeah. create bridges between those others yeah totally and one interesting thing that we've seen, I think, in in Protestantism generally is that there's been sort of a continuous schisming, right? Why is it better to to all be showing up to the same to the same church building on Sunday when we're so when we're so different? Because then you get the church of eyes or the church of ears yeah. or the church of livers, right? And and <laughs> and that's um, that's not the vision. I mean, you talk to any. Protestant, you know, any kind of serious uh, Protestant is really thoughtful about this, and they will acknowledge the the scandal of Christianity is its division. Um, that they know from reading the New Testament, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, the same thing that, that sent Joseph Smith in into the grove, and um, this is the scandal that that, that that plagues all of of Christianity, and and it's most accentuated within Protestantism, and so we don't want to go down that route. Um, I, I mean, I'm a pretty Catholic friendly, uh, went, went to Notre Dame, uh, cheered for Notre Dame against BYU. Uh, oh, um, uh, and so no, but, no worries. We can, uh, we can edit that part out, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> no, leave that. That's the most important thing. Um, uh, that's my identity. I'm a stage six Notre Dame, uh, uh Latter-day Saint. So, um, but, uh, but, but I think, Roman Catholicism over its 2000 years of history, it's, it's certainly not perfect, has a lot of issues. But one of the things it's figured out how to do is to create lots of communities for lots of people, depending on kind of their own proclivities, their own how they relate uh, with God, how they relate to other people, the things that they're passionate about. But to do that all in communion, literally, yeah. the thing that binds them all is the the celebration of the Lord's Supper, of, of, of mass, mm-hmm. of of their uh, coming together. And so, so you can have Jesuits and, and Franciscans and, and, you know, all these different kinds of orders that they've created within the church, but all in communion together around the thing that matters most. Uh, so I think, you know, we're young, we're small, you know, we're, we, we, we've prioritized unity, I, I think in really special ways, but that can also be stifling. And so what might it look like to, to have 
voluntary communities of affiliation, right? Where, where, where people get together because they're like-minded. But then what the church provides is a, especially the institutional church, that two hour block on Sunday, what that provides is a place where we all come together uh, regardless whatever, of whatever sub communities we've created throughout the week. Yeah. yeah. And there, so, go ahead, Aubrey. I just, I, that, that idea was so powerful to me when, when I heard this idea of the, uh, four, that, that maybe the goal is to have all four stages and like, we're all supposed to be there together. And I felt like both totally convicted and inspired because I think, I think that's a way that, you know, narcissism sort of slipped in and I, and, and I felt very, you know, proud when I could listen to someone and identify like, oh, I recognize that you were describing simplicity and, and like, even though I felt like that gave me more understanding and some compassion, I think there is a way where that actually really did kind of like feed this narcissism that like, I, right. I, I've, I've moved beyond this stage, but I, I, I like, I can see that you're trying, you know, and that, and so this, I needed this, I needed this new idea that like, no, 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 no. Like he is supposed to be here. And he belongs as much as I do. And I could hear Jody Moore's voice in my head saying, all this time I have been saying that these, this person, I, and actually I'll be very personal. Like I, my, I had a, a very specific experience on Sunday walking into church in the morning and seeing a, a, a leader who I've really struggled with for years because of this feeling that I think he is very comfortably in simplicity and it really bothers me. And I could hear Jody Moore's voice being like, oh my gosh, you know, all this time I've been saying that he is the barrier to my feeling like I belong. And, and I've been sitting here pushing him out in my own mind, just feeling so comfortable saying you're wrong and you need to, you're doing faith wrong. You're leading wrong. And, and you're the reason that I can't feel love and all. And I think that was really the real barrier. And, and I, I walked in and saw him and felt so much gratitude that like, thank you for being here and, and helping this be a four stage community. Like I want that. And, and you, it wouldn't be that without you and, you know, and lots of people, but I've just never felt like real gratitude. And I felt like for the first time, I actually could be open to learning something from him uh, instead of, I think I would listen, but I was listening for cues to help me recognize his stage. And, and this felt like I could imagine sitting and listening and, and actually being refined, actually growing myself and genuinely learning because it sort of broke down that narcissistic belief that I know where he's going and where he should go and how he should do better. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> brilliant. Um, uh, and I think, yeah, there is this, this temptation of, of narcissism, of, of the ego, of a kind of smugness that, that yeah. can come at, at any point along the road. And, and I think um, maybe, I mean, I, I mentioned this earlier, but maybe the, the, the burden and the opportunity for, for, for people who are in a, a stage four, uh, you know, place would be to, to, to create these bridges of understanding uh, be between the others who oftentimes can't even see each other or recognize each other, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, but, but the, the, the downside is that everybody then views you with, with some degree of suspicion. If, if, if you're in this right. place, you know, the, the, maybe the simplicity people think you're not, you're not fully on their team, but the people who are really going through perplexity, you know, they were really going through struggles and doubts they also view you with a little bit of suspicion too. Um, and, and so it's, it's the, the willingness to kind of absorb some of that and say, I, I recognize that, but I'm still gonna do my best to like be here and create these, these bridges, create relationships where, where people can hear and, and understand and, and love each other. That maybe that's, I mean, it, that's it, but it's a hard thing to do because you are absorbing the suspicion. Yeah. I love what David Brooks says about the edge of inside that like you don't enjoy the loyalty of the, like the approval and the loyalty of the insider or the outsider. And so you're just kind of in this very uncomfortable space, but like maybe that's the gift of, of stage three and four and and the gift of stage one and two is that they're going to keep creating those boundary markers and and like creating the container to hold us all and right. i i just have never recognized that as something that i if, like i benefit from too i benefit from the fact that we have an identity and probably if we started in this stage four harmony like i'm not sure how that identity would have ever 
been forged. Yeah, yeah, it may not have been strong enough, right? I, I, yeah. I, I'm thinking about Jared's presentation, I, uh, where where he mentioned being, I think, in a Sunday school class, and somebody had raised their hand, or the teacher had said something that was like totally like stage one, right? And then he said he could like start to sense other people like <laughs> raising their hands, who were going to correct, you know, and oh he was going to turn into yeah. this conflict, and instead he kind of inserted himself and validated both what, what the teacher or, or, or that, that first comment had said, but also then recognized, anticipated what was going to be said there. And, and in that moment did a kind of a, a peace building. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's, so that's a skill set, and that is a gift that can be offered to the community that otherwise would polarize. Yeah. So we, we need wow. some, yeah. uh, we, we, we need people, you know, who have their stakes in the ground and feel very strongly about where they are, but we need some glue. We, we need some horizontal connectors uh, to, to, to keep this all together. Yeah. And I think wow. also that, I mean, there's the idea that it, it maybe that it's supposed to be hard to not yeah. that, you know, not that we're always going to get, not that acceptance is always going to be uh, a reality or, you know, a, an abundance of, of tolerance or whatever, but that when we go and we're sort of in tension ideologically, or, you know, in terms of the, in terms of where you're at in your faith journey, like it is, going to be hard and maybe that's maybe that's the the purpose like i think we have a biological sort of need or desire to for everything to be easy and effortless but i think there's a spiritual need for things to be for things to be challenging i think my at least the way i imagine heavenly parents is is that their project for us in this life is is to grow and as anyone that's ever you know, participating in weight training knows like the only way to grow is through significant amounts of tension, significant amounts of discomfort over a long period of time and consistently. And this goes back to Eugene England and why the church is as true as the gospel, right? Yeah. It's th yeah. that church is what that church where we're meeting people that we don't d agree with that sometimes we don't like that are so hard to love that that is what's causing the tension that actually allows us to grow over time. Yeah, yeah completely. I think um, I think it's implanted where you say that you've never been in a bad ward, a bad ward, air quotes. Can you just uh -huh. talk about that for somebody? You're like, so talk lucky, to Patrick. Somebody? I've been in so many bad wards. <laughs> Would you like to name them, Tim? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's joking. <laughs> no, I'm setting I'm setting you up to just knock this out of the park and and use me as a bad example. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, par partly I'm lucky, and and I have heard. Um, I, you know, I have, I have a lot of friends who who just tell me horror stories about some, yeah. some of the warts they've been in. Um, I mean, the, the funny thing is that that it's all uh, oftentimes it's it's relative, right? That uh, the friends of mine who experienced a particular ward as as really hard, even to the point that they they couldn't do it anymore. I'll bet if you polled other people in the ward, they'd say, "Oh, this is the best ward I've ever been in." Right. Uh, the, the people are so amazing and, and so forth. So it's, um, you know, a ward is several hundred people oftentimes. And so you, you're going to have really different different experiences. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I I uh, so partly it's luck uh, on, on on my on my side, but it's also um, wards are, are partly what what you make of them. And 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 I know I know whenever I say something like that. Uh, it runs the risk of trivializing the experiences that some people are having that, again, are just really hard. Again, I, I've got really good friends here in Cache Valley who had um, uh, some really uh, tough stuff in, in their ward, including with their kids, and, and they had to end up going to a different ward, and, and, and now they're much happier, and, and they, they are, are whole, again, spiritually. They, they can feel the spirit in church in, in the way that because of these interactions, they, they just weren't able to uh, in, in, in their previous ward. So, so I know that happens. Um, but, but most of the time, I, I think there is a way that, that, that we can create space for ourselves. We can create space for others. We can, we can recognize, I, I think part of what we've just been talking about can be a big part of, it, of recognizing the paradigm isn't to go to church with, with people who are like me. Um, so, so that way I'm, I'm not disappointed or surprised <laughs> when, yeah. when he says something that, that I disagree with. Um, but, you know, I, I think the great strength of Mormonism uh, has been the way that it creates communities. 
Uh, and community is tough. Community is real, really hard. So again, sometimes it, it is um, oppressive and, and even abusive. But most of the time, most Latter-day Saint communities really are communities of care, um, where, where ordinary people are doing their absolute best at all of these different stages uh, to create a place where, where people can experience God and, and serve each other. And so, so that's what I mean when I say I've, I've never been in a bad ward, because I, because I see... I see what's going on in that ward, right? I see the amount of hours that people are spending and serving each other, right? And teaching my kids and primary, I, I, they may come home and I may disagree with something that they taught, right? I mean, like right now, like we're, we're dealing with like the primary uh, program is coming up or even just, you know, they, they've been singing Book of Mormon stories and, uh, and doing some of the, the, the hand signals that, um, you know, kind of the, the old, the old fashioned, uh, Indian hand signals. And, and I don't love that. Right. And so we're thinking about like, do we talk to anybody about it? Do we let it slide? I mean, you know, so, so we all have to like navigate these kinds of things within community because it's, it's personalities involved and people and, and what, what are the fights that you want to fight? Some, some things, you're like, hey, I'm, I'm going to die on that hill. Other things, you're like, eh, maybe not. I can let this one go. We, we all have to discern how, how to make this work. Um, but but I think wards are amazing places uh, where that the marshal the talents of, of a lot of sincere people just doing their best. Yeah. And to be clear, just uh, in my joke, I'm saying that I have I have created I have had a perspective that has created my reality many times in which yeah. I've been very judgmental of my ward. But um, I, I think uniformly i have been in wards that are full of uh, that are full of people that are doing their best and that are acting uh acting the best way they know how to to love everybody else in their ward and obviously we're nobody's perfect yeah. but i i do want to be clear that e even in our current, current ward we are so we are so surrounded by people who are just full of love and um when i when i am in a mind mindset where i'm going to church giving the benefit of the doubt i see how how christ like the people that surround me really really are do you do you have any other practical steps? Say somebody's listening to this and saying, "I want to have that perspective. Like, I want to look at these people charitably, um, but I'm just not feeling it." When I when I go into church, what I'm feeling is uh, is resentment and or you know anger, and potentially then when I feel those things, I know I shouldn't be feeling them. So now I feel guilty or I feel ashamed of myself. Do you have practical steps that people can sort of just like start? I don't know, applying maybe day to day to to start to work toward a place. Um, where they're feeling, where, where they're feeling more, more, I guess, harmony, you know, toward, uh, toward their fellow community members. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm, I'm not sure that I have a, you know, the kind of silver bullet or magic wand. I do think, uh, I, I really believe um, in, in the promise that the uh, Moroni makes us when he says, when he tells us, you know, to pray for charity. Uh, like, uh, and, and what that means is for me, at least, and because I've practiced this and, and I've seen it be real, I don't think it's something magical that just like you pray for it and then God and then it like descends on you, uh, you know, some kind of like vending machine uh, thing. I think the act of praying for charity uh, and, and this can, can't even be proactive, like before you go to church on Sunday. Right. To uh, what that does, I, I think what that prayer does, especially if it's a regular part of your prayer life, a regular part of your kind of contemplative practice is it's already putting you in the mindset of saying, how am I going to orient myself uh, with generosity towards other people? So it's it's not waiting for, for for God to change it all, you know, magically or to change other people even. It's it's sort of reorienting yourself um, in, in relation to the situation it takes. And, it, and, it, and it's hard. And, and again, it, you know, some, some days it, it, it just doesn't work. Uh, but, but it's a, it's a fundamental reorientation, I think, towards, towards the members of our community. And it's, I, and, and then part of it um, too, I, I, I sort of learned this lesson a long time ago uh, from, from my dad who said, I, I think I was probably a teenager when, when he talked about this, he said, I don't go to church to learn anything. Uh, mm -hmm. at, at this point, he says, if, if I learn something great, uh, fantastic. That's like, you know, cherry on top. But he says, I, I'm there first and foremost to worship God. I, I, I'm, I'm there to take the sacrament. I'm there to to reflect on uh, Jesus's atoning work for me uh, and God's love for me. And then to reflect that back to others, however I can. 
Wow. Um, and so church gives me a structured opportunity where I can in, in this space where I can be there for somebody else. Um, and that's, again, that that's hard to do sometimes, especially, you know, uh, other people sometimes control the classroom or control the pulpit and, and things like that. But but I think when we go to church with that kind of attitude that, that we're here for love of God and then love of other people, the vertical and the horizontal, um, I, th- I think it sort of changes our attitude. I love that. And then it was so powerful. I There are definitely eras of my life where I was going to church with really sensitive ears and I'm just listening for those red flag words that will cue me that somebody is either with me or against me. And and when when that's the experience, you're that's exactly what you get. Like you're going to leave feeling like you know who your friends are and you feel divided from everybody else. And I think if charity is your prayer, then it, it sort of changes it changes the way you hear everything. Like you, instead you're, you're hearing things that make you feel connected. You're, you're hearing pain and you're hearing things that resonate. And instead of sorting people, you just feel, you just, you're able to really just feel love. And, and then it just doesn't seem like it, it matters quite as much. Yeah. 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 Okay. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Patrick. Is there, are any final thoughts you want to leave us with before, before we sign off, just given the context of this Maybe, discussion you know, the one thing i so uh when i was thinking about what we were going to talk about um you know it occurred to me that most of life is boring like <laughs> the, the vast majority of life is boring and a lot of life is a letdown <laughs> and i i was thinking about this actually uh a, a couple different kind of analogies or metaphors so one like from the sports world i, I love sports and um you know, like when you're watching like an amazing playoff game where so much is at stake and people are, I mean, there's so much emotion. It's, it's incredible. And then to go to a regular season game, you know, if you're baseball, like one of 162 games, who cares what's going on? Even the players don't really care that much. Right. So, so, so there's some of that. I, I also remembered, uh, I, I once like the best meal of my life, um, uh, some some friends took Melissa and I to to this restaurant. Incredible! It's 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 run by Jose Andres, the the world famous chef, and yeah. it was it was like w- when we got there, uh, the the waiter was like, you know, do you want to order off the menu, or would you like the chef to take you on a journey? We're like journey. <laughs> I'll take I'll take the journey. <laughs> journey. So like it was literally the most incredible culinary experience of my life. Like, wow. and then we went home, went to bed. And the next morning we opened the cupboard and there's like cereal, <laughs> right? It's, I mean, that's, that's what life is. Um, that's, that's exactly what, 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 what life is. You, you mentioned Eugene England uh, uh, earlier and, and it's great, you know, why the church is as true as the gospel. I always remember this one line from it where he says, he talks, uh, he opens it with this example of he was a kid, he was at a state conference. He wasn't even paying attention. He was teasing his sister. Uh, and then I think it was Harold B. Lee was there, was talking. He was not even listening, but then something happened. Like the spirit just like hit him like a ton of bricks. And, and he says, how many boring state conferences would I attend to be even once in the presence of such grace? Wow. Right. And so like life is boring. (laughs) Life is tedious. Life is mundane. Anybody who's a parent knows this. Anybody who has a job knows this. Anybody who's a church member knows this. And so, um, so part of, I think mortality, part of this experience of just being human is like one foot in front of the other, um, going through all of that, there will be transformational moments occasionally, right? There will be these just transcendent occurrences, but they're really rare. And part of what life is, is just like showing up as a parent, showing up mm-hmm. uh, as a, an employee, as a church member, uh, to be in a place where you can be struck by this incredible moment of grace every once in a while. Uh, and then And then that gets you through the next morning of breakfast cereal (laughs) love it oh my gosh thank you so much much. beautiful thank you for sharing your insights yeah i think it's really really gonna be helpful all right thanks so much for listening we really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with patrick mason and as a reminder patrick has a new podcast that he co-hosts with jennifer walker thomas called proclaim peace this podcast is sponsored by the faith matters foundation and mormon women for ethical government and you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts you can check out more at faithmatters.org